Unaffiliated voters aren't all that different from Colorado's Democrats and Republicans. Instead of shaking up the primaries for governor in the first year that unaffiliates could vote, they seem to have just rubber stamped the front runners, made it a race between Republican Walker Stapleton and Democrat Jared Polis. Our Marshall Zellinger is here to offer a colorful assessment of what we've learned. Kyle, I've got three maps to show you. Map one right here is only if Democrats and Republicans voted in the primary like it had been every other time. The darker the red, the more Republicans that voted. The darker the blue, the more Democrats. When we get lighter, it's obviously closer to a mix. And then out here in Garfield County, for instance, it's pretty even. So what I'm about to do is switch this map to include the unaffiliated voters to show you what kind of chaos they caused in the primary. Wait for it. Did you see? Wait, let me do that again. <laughs> Unaffiliated voters now. Not much difference. I pointed out Garfield County before. You can see the unaffiliated voters turned in more Democratic ballots in that county to give it a blue color. So now I'm going to take away Republicans and Democrats altogether. This is strictly unaffiliated voters. We don't know who the unaffiliated voters voted for specifically, but we do know that in the major counties, like a swing county, like Jefferson County, Two to one turned in Democratic ballots. Let me show you Larimer County, which was swing two years ago. 8,000 more ballots for Democrats than Republicans. What we can take from this map, Kyle, is that these metropolitan areas that are shaded blue because of unaffiliated voters are likely the places that you're going to see a lot of concentration because these are the areas that the Republican candidate, specifically for Governor Walker Stapleton, will need to shift back to red if unaffiliated voters really do swing the election in Colorado. Voters in those counties, brace yourselves. Marshall, thank you. Biggest loser of the night wasn't even a candidate. It was Victor Mitchell's bank account. He loaned his campaign $4.8 million. He only took in $66,000 in outside donations, and there's only $200,000 left over to pay himself back for that big loan. Wolf. For 4.8 mil, I mean, that could be a, a million vanilla lattes, 330 seats on the glass for every Avs game next year, or Vic Mitchell could have bought a Tesla SUV for himself and 36 of his closest friends. But you know, Republicans do not have a monopoly on spending money like it's monopoly money. While Vic Mitchell's personal investment comes out to be $33 for every vote he received, Jared Polis, the Democratic nominee, he spent even more per vote, $11 million of his own money. He paid premium prices for those votes, $42 apiece. Lost in the primary battles atop the tickets were two incumbent state legislators who got bounced overnight, both of them Republicans. Judy Rayher represents Southern Colorado near Pueblo, but not for much longer. And Phil Covarrubias, who reps parts of Adams and Arapahoe counties, also lost his GOP primary. So many of you told us that you were sick and tired of all of the political ads during the primary. How's that song go? B -b -b Baby, you ain't, ain't seen nothing yet. And Brandon Riddiman has the mic. The final campaign finance reports for yesterday's primary aren't due until next week, but we do have fairly recent numbers to work with. Republican nominee Walker Stapleton's campaign raised $2 million and spent almost all of that. He also got help from an outside group called Better Colorado Now, which pitched in another million dollars for the cause. That's a pretty decent amount of spending in a primary, but Democrat Jared Polis went bigger a lot bigger, spending what to most of us would be a fortune. $11.3 million of his own personal money. Oh, and he raised another hundred grand or so from donations and also got outside help from a group called Bold Colorado to the tune of $400,000. All that was just to get on the ballot for November. By the time we get there, the political experts we talked with predict this race will cost another $40 million to $250 million. Exactly where in that range is going to depend on how close this race appears, but we do expect big national money to pour in trying to sway which party controls our governor's mansion. You can expect the ads to ramp up between now and Election Day, which is November 6th. Some may start pretty soon, but there's another day to watch. 
September 7th, lowest unit rate day, they call it. That's 60 days before the election. And by federal regulations at this time, candidates have the right to buy TV ads from stations like this one for the lowest possible price. For example, say a car dealership were to buy 100 TV ads and get a big discount for buying in bulk. The candidates get to buy their ads for that same lower price. The idea is to help them be able to communicate over the public airwaves, but it also helps all those millions go just a little further. For next, I'm Brandon Ritterman. Can I just say I'm going to miss Doug Robinson? has nothing to do with the Republican candidate for governor's politics. It has everything to do with the fact that Doug Robinson is a man who does not take himself too seriously. Last night, trailing badly, he's in the single digits, he tweets out the results numbers and says, I'm new at this. This is played like golf, right? We're going to miss that. Also, this is kind of awkward sauce, but I feel like we should point out that Jared Polis is not wearing a Nine News polo shirt in our official Decision 2018 graphic. It's just where the watermark sits, and it's the same color as the shirts that we wear on air. I'm going to suggest to the bosses that we remake that graphic. Two Coloradans are on President Trump's list to replace retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy, who turned in his notice today. Same list that the President pulled Colorado's Neil Gorsuch from. There on the left, you see Allison Ide. On the right, Timothy Timkovich, both from the Tenth Circuit here in Denver. They are on the President's list of 25 contenders that everybody thinks are approved by the Federalist Society. Investigators in Denver still cannot figure out what started that massive construction fire at 18th and Emerson in March. They, they know what didn't start at this point, so they have ruled out welders and plumbers and drywall workers and framers and insulation workers and electricians. They are certain it wasn't the electrical cords or the power units inside the building. They continue to search for the cause, looking for answers for the families of two construction workers who died in that fire from smoke inhalation. You'll remember a nearby building was also destroyed. Cars parked near the building were burned and basically melted. Denver Fire told us today everything is still open, still under investigation. Annabelle Bolin revealed this morning that she is fighting Alzheimer's, like her husband. Broncos owner Pat Bolin, who has not been seen in public now for years. It is a reminder that wealth and privilege are no defense against the cruelty of that disease. If your family is also in the fight, there are free resources from people who know the impact of Alzheimer's. We'll be sharing that information on the screen. You can also find it on the next Facebook page. I hope we will also take the opportunity for this conversation about Alzheimer's to banish the idea of joking about Alzheimer's or using it as an insult when somebody's forgetful or absent-minded. I don't think that anybody says it to be cruel, but it is. It is exceptionally cruel if you unknowingly say that around someone with a loved one who is fading away before their eyes. We can do this. We can change the way we use language. Thoughtful people stop using the R word as a joke or an insult. They know that it's callousness to people with intellectual disabilities. We've talked here about thinking twice before applying words like crazy, insane, and bipolar, when other words make the exact same point without the pain. Let's add Alzheimer's to the list of words that cross our lips only with compassion, never knowing whose ears it might reach. We hit 100 in Denver today. Thanks for your hard work, everybody. Did I mention it's going to be hotter tomorrow? And this could be our most controversial segment yet. What's the right way to say the name of our state? Colorado, 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 Colorado. What do you say? Email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext during the break. It's the battle for Colorado. I mean Colorado. Next. Denver is currently tweaking its plan for legal scooters in the city so bros won't be riding like outlaws anymore. The scooter companies, of course, dumped all those scooters in town, kind of forced the city into a negotiation once people liked them, and then agreed to pull them off the streets early last week while they work on this official plan for a pilot permit program. Denver Public Works told us today that they do plan on opening up this process for legal scooters with applications beginning on Friday.
101 degrees in Denver today, the first triple digit high of the season, and it goes warmer tomorrow. The record tomorrow is 10, is actually 99. I think we're going to go to 103, and the all-time record for the date is 105. Crazy when you see the clouds out there producing wind and lightning, but it is a hot day, and the storms that have been developing, moving from the southwest to the northeast, are producing damaging winds to 60 miles per hour and no rain. Red flag warnings extended out from much of eastern Colorado and eastern Utah, and fire danger remains a prime concern with high pressure located here and the storm track to the north, all that warm desert air sweeping in from the southwest. So these high base storms producing wind and lightning move out around 8.30, 9 o'clock, and then they return tomorrow afternoon. But really no rain in the forecast until maybe, just maybe, the weekend. Tonight, isolated storms early, then clearing low 64. Tomorrow, hot high of 103. That breaks the record of 99 degrees. Still warm on Friday and dry. Dry storms on Saturday. Better chance of rain from storm Sunday. And then we have a warming trend that leads us into the 4th of July. No fireworks from Mother Nature expected. Hey, Kyle, don't forget to check out the full strawberry moon tonight. And Saturn will be out there clearly visible, too. You know, I love a good strawberry moon. I know you do. I need to confess, the single most popular request for our What Do You Say place name pronunciation debate series it's a word that I've been too scared to touch. So many of you have asked us to do this. You got Jim and Shirley and Clark and Kirsten and Victoria and Donna and Alex and Stan and Leanna and Mike and Jacqueline and more. All who want us to settle the debate on how you pronounce the name of our state. Colorado? Colorado? What if the right answer is something completely different entirely? What if there isn't a right answer? Well, we begin, as we always do, by asking a local, in this case, Governor Hickenlooper, what do you say? Colorado. There it is. Rado, Colorado. That is what the governor says. But you know we can't leave it there. A linguist from Metro State University in Denver found five pronunciations. And they tell a story about the strife that our state has seen, as well as the current conflict between natives and newcomers. There has always been an issue over what is the right way to say Colorado. Linguist Rich Sandoval says English speakers who named our state wanted to rip the word from its Spanish roots. El Rio Colorado. Evidence from the 1800s shows schools teaching a version that sounds strange to our ears. Colorado. Colorado. We'll call that the pioneer pronunciation. Another way of saying our state's name still persists on the plains. You can still hear Colorado which is an older version that used to be more popular, but there still are people that you might find in the Eastern Plains saying Colorado. Sandoval says Spanish speakers often use Spanglish. Colorado. They might still do the addo thing, but you'll hear a co instead of a ca. But the dominant pronunciations highlight Colorado's clash between natives and newcomers. Locals will say, well, of course it's Colorado. That's how I've always said it. I grew up with Colorado. That's, that's what we say. It sounds right. It's our state. We have the right to decide and, and to tell you how to say it. You're the new ones, right? Newcomers are more likely to hew closer to the Spanish pronunciation. Colorado, you don't say avocado, right? So it should be Colorado, like avocado, like tostado, right? Sandoval says that's a larger trend in language practiced by people who think they're better educated. He sees this newer pronunciation squeezing out the most recent native one. I don't know if the Colorado thing will ever disappear because it is a marker of insider status, but at the same time, for those locals who fashion themselves as being highly educated and that kind of thing, there's going to be some pressure on them to say Colorado. We'll see what happens in the future. Sandoval says his job as a linguist is not to decide which version is right. He's more interested in studying why people think they're right. As language shifts and it changes, shaped always by current events and by culture as it always has been in our state. In this article on 9news.com, you can hear all five of those pronunciations. Native, newcomer, plains, pioneer, Spanglish. You can hear them side by side. For whatever it's worth, none of the natives on the next team use the so-called native pronunciation. And me? Now I'm just scared to say the name of our state. Next, we meet a police officer whose beat is Christmas, and he is a busy cop even this time of year. Next chooses to highlight the good ones, because it seems like every time a public servant gets in trouble, you know, a police officer or a teacher, that seems to always make the local news. And we know the real story about the good ones, and they're almost all good ones. Officer David Ford works for the Lilton Police Department, honored today with an unparalleled community impact award 
for his shopping. Every day is an opportunity to learn something. If there was a day to show the unpredictability of an officer's job, today is that day. Since 2009, Littleton police officer David Ford has worked traffic. <laughs> One moment, he's checking on kids at the park. The next, it started up by the road, assisting firefighters with what they do best. There's this no, is, yeah, this there's is no it, fire man. hydrant here. This is... When I was little, I didn't really realize this, but now I look back, my role model, the the father figure, as you would put it. Uh, was actually Officer Ritchie with the Lakewood Police Department and the D.A.R.E. program at Belmar Elementary. That officer, that role model, made the difference. Coming to school and seeing that officer and just, I don't know, it made me feel good when I was little. <laughs> David started his own program with Littleton PD. So it's one of those things where I, I find uh, underprivileged children. And I Shop didn't... with a cop. <laughs> Spending $100 alongside a police officer, all at no cost to the kids. Donors front the money every year. Just try to build those bonds with the kids and just, you know, give them a Christmas they may not have had normally. My daughter's asking why I can't sit, and wife says because he's famous. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> big fish, small pond. Today, he's here with his family. Spending the first Christmas with my kids and just having that magical moment of opening the president's Christmas morning and knowing that in the community that I work for, not everybody gets to share that moment. Being awarded the first Unparalleled Community Impact Award. So today's recipient is Officer David Ford. <laughs> Front and center. I think it's backwards, Chief. Uh, I think uh... <laughs> David knows he's not here if they're not here. Through a lot of work, her and I have built a beautiful family. Going to be more proud of my, my children, Colton, Jade. Here for him, here for his work. I thank every single one of them for being here for me. Sorry. <laughs> here. Thank you. Because in middle school, he met a police officer. For next, I'm Chris Hansen. Officer Ford hasn't seen Officer Ritchie from Lakewood PD since sixth grade. He told us he would love to reconnect with him to say thanks. Let us know if you can help make the connection. This show could be entirely filled with the bad parking pictures that you send me every day, but we have to limit it to just one a day. And a run on poop shaped trophies has one man feeling flush. I'll show myself out. Westminster gets us, you and me. I mean, why else would the city have held a golden poo competition over the weekend, offering these poo-shaped trophies to the volunteers who could pick up the most dog dew from a city park? Adam Lundeen pro probably tweeted this to us as he picked up more than six pounds, won the golden trophy. Forty people received one of these. Not sure if everybody like Adam has it proudly displayed on their desk. Time again to tell a fellow Coloradan, Colorado, uh, you've crossed a line. Check out this sweet parking job. This is, this is great. This is the zero effort parking job. I like this. Jenna Freeland spotted this. Saw the car parked more than an hour on Pennsylvania, just south of 13th in Cap Hill. That's some nice work, and it deserves to be honored on the news. Send us here the ones you've seen next at 9news.com or hashtag HeyNext. I'm glad that we settled this state pronunciation debate. Kelly says Colorado, like avocado, a fourth generation CO native has spoken. Except Kelly, I also got an email from Bridget who says she's a native and says you don't spell the word rad as rod. I'm glad that we've worked this up. <laughs> Zach Samar says, I switch it up. I prefer not to be predictable. Have to keep people on their toes. I like that, I might start doing that. And JC writes in to say, Kyle, all natives know that the name of our state is pronounced California. Oh, that's savage, dude. See you next time.